Hello and welcome to DM It All, a show where we talk about D&D books and tabletop gaming history. For this episode, we're going to try making a shorter video for once, focused on a single concept in D&D. Our first topic in this format will cover an iconic oddity, the saving throw. In D&D combat, attackers are typically the ones to roll dice in order to succeed. Saving throws are the most glaring exception to this rule, as they have the defender roll to succeed instead. This lack of consistency stands out in modern editions, but it was fairly common for old school D&D to have wonky and contradictory subsystems. In AD&D, for example, characters had to roll a d6 in order to open a stuck door, but other feats of strength, such as opening gates, required a roll of a d100 instead. If that wasn't weird enough, checks like these could fail if characters rolled too high. Yes, sometimes rolling low was a good thing in old school D&D. As D&D evolved over the years, streamlining and unifying these rules was obviously priority. The saving throw is one of the few remaining exceptions, though there have been many attempts to simplify this mechanic. Saving throws are usually used to decide any sort of special attack outside of standard combat, and in a fantasy game there are many unique effects that need to be codified into rules. For example, a Medusa should be able to petrify a group of adventurers based on the lore behind the creature. But it wouldn't be fun for the party to instantly die every time they encountered a Medusa, nor would it be interesting if a Medusa's stare simply dealt damage instead of a unique effect. Devastating abilities dynamically change how the party perceives and approaches encounters, but there need to be rules for survival. So saving throws were added to D&D as a final chance to save a character from a brutal attack. Hence, the name. But the idea of a saving throw was actually somewhat ubiquitous by the time D&D was released. Gygax even referred back to this common knowledge when he finally got around to explaining the concept in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. The saving throw allegedly dates back to a 1966 pamphlet named Rules for Medieval War Games. As you might know, D&D originally came out of the wargaming hobby, where two players use miniatures to simulate large-scale battles. The creator of rules for medieval wargames was Tony Bath, and his system had both the attacker and the defender role to see if a unit was taken out. Even though the defender's role was called a saving throw, this mechanic varied considerably from saving throws in D&D. In Bath's rules, saving throws were made for all attack roles, while D&D as a whole used it for everything outside of standard combat. Defenders in this wargaming system had to roll a d6 and try to hit a specific number based on their armor and their opponent's weapon. Tony Bath's rules had a huge impact on the wargaming genre, solidifying saving throws as a common concept. In fact, saving throws are still used for standard combat in modern wargaming systems like Warhammer. D&D's co-creator Gary Gygax took a lot of influence from Tony Bath when he worked on his own wargame, Chainmail. For those that don't know, this was the progenitor to Dungeons & Dragons. You can check out our video on the original edition of D&D to learn more. But armor-based saving throws were omitted from Chainmail, as Gygax left combat up to the aggressor. Armor, in his game, was just a flat number that the attacker needed to hit. Also included in Chainmail's release was a fantasy supplement meant for Tolkien-esque battles. This supplement had four instant death attacks. The Basilisk's Petrifying Gaze dragon breath, wizard spells, and a spider's bite, which was presumably poison. All of these attacks were obviously unblockable by armor, but the presence of these effects didn't change gameplay for most of the units. Chainmail was based on disposable medieval grunts that already died whenever they took damage, and the default game even had an instant death effect due to unblockable damage caused by siege weapons. But there needed to be different rules for the fantasy supplement, as it included brand new hero units that were meant to mimic legendary characters like Legolas and Gandalf. These stronger units could often only be killed in specific circumstances. Hero units, for example, could only die to regular soldiers if they took 4 damage in one skirmish. Likewise, there needed to be forgiving rules for the instant death effects that didn't require an attack roll. Ergo, the saving throw. Gygax ruled that these stronger units could be saved if the defending player rolled high enough while using two d6s. The four instant death effects that demanded saving throws in Chainmail basically defined the saving throw categories in the original release of Dungeons & Dragons. Unlike modern editions, early saving throws were specifically based on the effect that was being avoided. 
so characters got separate saving throws against Poison, Petrification, Dragon Breath, and Spells. There was also a new saving throw just for Wands, because they couldn't be counted as spells for whatever reason. This would be a common feature of early saving throws, as the categories for them were often random. Incident spells, for example, were usually grouped with poisons rather than the spells category. It's not a logical choice, but it makes for a more balanced game, since most classes had terrible spell saves. Not only was this the first time that saving throws required a d20 roll, but also the first time that saving throws gradually improved. Like with most class features, players had to refer back to a scaling table to learn more about their saving throws. The target number the player needed to hit for each save would become smaller as the character leveled, making the saving throws gradually easier to reach. Each of the three core D&D classes had a different scaling progression for their saving throws. Fighters improved their throws at the fastest rate and ended with the best saves overall. Magic users gained their throws at a much slower pace but had the best saves versus petrification and spells. Cleric saves improved about as fast as the fighters, but they ended up with the worst saves overall. They did attain the best poison saves, which made sense lore-wise due to all the snake handling that the holy men are apt to do. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons largely kept this system intact, though it changed the categories. Paralyzation was added to poison and death magic, staves were merged with wands instead of spells, and Polymorph was added to the Petrification save. AD&D also clarified that there is a hierarchy to the saving throws if an effect fell into multiple categories. The spell saving throw, for example, was basically for any spell that didn't fit the other saves. One inexplicable deviation from the original rules, though, was the decision to give level 1 fighters the worst saving throws in every possible category. The fighter eventually gained the best saving throws by the time they reached max level, but this made low-level fighters extremely vulnerable to the game's deadliest attacks. In general, the disparity in saving throws between the classes increased from original D&D. High-level thieves, for example, would always have terrible saving throws against Dragon Breath. AD&D was, however, the first system to allow character stats to modify saving throws, but the benefits were very specific. Characters with high wisdom got a bonus for mind-affecting abilities, while characters with high dexterity were granted dodge bonuses against spells like Fireball and Lightning Bolt. As you can imagine, these AD&D stat bonuses confused things a bit, since they only applied to particular effects that already fell within a particular category. So Thieves got this dexterity improved bonus against spells like Fireball, but not spells like Confusion. So players would have to remember to factor in these bonuses on a case-by-case -case basis. And 2nd Edition used the exact same system, so there were no improvements there. The basic version of D&D, on the other hand, tried to simplify things. The first release of Basic used the original D&D saving throws, but the second release had Wisdom affect a character's save versus magical effects. This bonus was still not applied in a specific save category, but at least it was a bonus to a common threat. The third release of Basic also added an optional rule to allow every stat aside from Charisma to adjust different saving throws. This idea set the stage for future additions, but here it had some mixed results, mainly with intelligence saves as they only affected mind attacks, so this wound up creating the same annoying bookkeeping as AD&D's saves. And yes, it was wisdom for mind attacks in AD&D and intelligence in basic. Again, consistency is not D&D's strongest suit. Stats only became more important as D&D evolved, and publishers wanted saving throws to reflect this new philosophy, but there was no clean way to do this with the existing system. Third edition revamps saving throws, condensing and narrowing them down to the way in which a character resisted a negative effect. So instead of five different saving throws, there were now only three, Fortitude, Reflex, and Will. Fortitude saves allowed characters to resist poisons and diseases. Reflex saves allowed characters to dodge traps and fireballs. And Will saves allowed characters to resist mind-altering abilities and magical effects. Dexterity improved reflex saving throws, Wisdom improved Will, and Constitution improved Fortitude. The threshold that players needed to hit for their saves was also based on the stats of the enemy and the type of spell being used. Because of these changes, 3rd edition managed to codify the physical actions involved within a saving throw, for better and for worse. 
Until 3rd edition, it was never explained exactly how a wizard saved against a spell, or how a fighter avoided a dragon's breath attack. Story-wise, a wizard could have used his own magic to reflect spells used against him, while a fighter could have used his supernatural physical endurance to withstand a dragon's flames. But with the new rules, everyone was just jumping out of the way of these hazards in every instance. Still, this meant it was much easier to adjudicate saving throws, as well as make up new ones on the spot. Each class received one or two good saving throws, but there would at least be one save that progressed at half the rate. This save was typically trash against enemies of equal level. Fighters, for example, only received high fortitude, leaving them forever vulnerable to effects that targeted their reflex or will saves. 3rd edition quickly released a revised version known as 3.5. This revision sought to rebalance many elements of 3rd edition, including the spells. Hold Person received the most notable change in 3.5, as it now allowed characters to roll a saving throw each round. Originally, characters had only one opportunity to shake off the effect when the spell was cast. They would then be held for the entire duration of the spell. Now characters could break free from the effect with a successful roll. This attempt used up the character's entire turn, but this was still an improvement over the older versions of the spell. This change also applied to similar effects like Hold Monster and Hold Animal. That essentially made this the first major change to the infamous Save or Die concept. Save or Die effects are abilities like the Medusa's Gaze that essentially remove a character from a fight based on a single saving throw. These not only included literal death spells, but also spells that rendered characters completely helpless, such as Sleep and the aforementioned Hold Person. These effects were often accused of being excessively unfun, since survival depended entirely on a single random dice roll, and players had little opportunity to react. Save or Die effects overrode D&D's complex tactical gameplay, and replaced it with a high-stakes game of craps. There may be some dungeon masters and players that don't mind this, but there is a reason why the back-and-forth nature of hit points permeated other game systems a lot more than the concept of a saving throw. The revision to the Hold Person spell would become the norm for the 4th edition of Dungeons & Dragons. As always, 4th edition served as an outlier from the other systems. In this case, it was the only edition where the defender didn't roll the initial saving throw. Instead, the attacker would roll and try to hit a specific defense type. Fortitude, reflex, and will become static numbers that the attacker needed to hit just like with armor class. Different classes got bonuses to these categories, but all classes progressed at the same rate. And even if a character was actually hit with a monstrous effect, it would usually start out as a relatively minor condition. Characters would then roll an unmodified d20 for each negative effect they suffered at the end of their turn. Rolling a 10 or higher would dispel the condition, giving every character around a 50% chance of success. If a character failed their saving throw, the condition would persist or worsen. For example, a Medusa's gaze will only slow characters at the start. After the first failed saving throw, the character would then become immobilized. The character would only become fully petrified after the second failed saving throw. These two failures and the initial attack roll essentially granted characters three chances to survive. These radical changes obviously deviated from other saves, which is probably why 5th edition decided to go in a different direction entirely. The only exception is with 5th edition's death saving throws, but the history behind those rules are extensive enough to merit their own video possibly in the future. Like with a lot of its rules, 5th edition felt a lot closer to 3rd edition than its immediate predecessor, but it still used a very different system. Each of the main 6 stats could now be used as a saving throw directly. So instead of a reflex saving throw, characters just rolled a dexterity saving throw. Characters could also now roll saves for intelligence, strength, and charisma. These saves scale based on a character's proficiency bonus, a modifier that also improves attack and skill bonuses, and it gets better as the character levels. But characters only got this bonus for the saves in which they add proficiency, and characters usually only add proficiency in two saving throws. This left characters with even more glaring weak spots than any previous edition, as non-proficient saving throws never improved at all. Fortunately, 5th edition does grant the option to go gain proficiency in different saving throws later, not to mention that the target numbers scale a lot less than with previous editions. Not all 5th edition saving throws are created equal though, and some are called upon more often than others. For instance, players needed to frequently dodge dangerous traps with dexterity, while Charisma only gets tested in rare situations. 
So every class essentially received one common save and one rare save. But this only begs the question why they added more saves to begin with, especially since the most common saves remain the Fortitude, Reflex, and Will categories from the 3rd edition. The idea here is to imitate ability checks more closely, but this does blur the line between the two. When is a Charisma check different from a Charisma save? While one is reactive and the other is proactive, is the distinction notable enough to require different roles? And are the dozen spells that use Charisma saves worth fracturing the will save from previous editions? Save or die effects are closer to 3rd edition, as they've been nerfed on a case-by-case -case basis, instead of being codified into something more forgiving. Some influences from 4th edition remain as well, as many status effect spells allow a save at the end of their turn. There are even certain spells like Contagion and Flesh to Stone, which only inflict their total effect when three saves are filled in a row. But monster effects like the Medusa's Glare allow only two failed saves before unleashing their worst effect, which is annoyingly inconsistent. An interesting concept that 5th edition did introduce was that certain monster effects like these had tiers of success. A Medusa, for example, can instantly petrify a character if they fail a save by 5 or more. This concept isn't in the player's handbook at all either, and is only reserved for specific monster effects. So while there is some influence from 4th edition that saves are less feast or famine, the mechanics vary a lot from effect to effect. This analysis is not intended to mock one edition over another but simply analyze the concept's history and progression. The last three editions each completely revamped the save system in different ways, so the rules could definitely be improved upon. It's a difficult task to modernize saving throws, since their very nature feels contrary to D&D's system, requiring the defender to see if a bad effect happens to them, something that's typically handled by the DM. But that disparity might not be a bad thing. After all, it keeps the players engaged in combat outside of their turns, and allows them to roll for the fate of their character, rather than being told, Oh, you got poisoned and died. Too bad. That admittedly could provide an argument for introducing armor saves too, but some players appreciate that special effects function differently than regular attacks. This is probably why the 4th edition's changes, enemies hitting static numbers, didn't end up sticking despite them feeling like logical changes on paper. But we do appreciate that system's attempts to codify status effects, even if it's just from a design perspective. In general, each save system represents their edition well. Earlier editions loved their tables and inconsistent mechanics. Third and fifth edition tried to be faithful to older systems in spirit, even if the rules played very differently. And fourth edition was content to do its own thing, as per usual. We'd personally go with the fourth or fifth edition, but the earlier rule sets have their own advantages too. The older systems are still even used in D&D retro clones like Pathfinder. The biggest deciding factor for our favorite edition was the reduced amount of saber die effects since the newer systems naturally moved away from them, but we're sure some older players see that as a detriment. Saving throws in D&D fundamentally represented Gygax's mercy towards his own players, so your favorite system will likely depend on how merciful you want the game world to be. But hey, let us know what you think. Which set of saving throw rules are your favorite and why? What would be your ideal system? What are your feelings on save or die effects? And let us know what you think of this shorter video format. Feel free to suggest topics for future videos as well. Comment down below and subscribe to our channel while you're at it. And don't forget to ring the bell to be updated on all our new videos. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you all next session.